Hello Dragon Wisps. Welcome to today's video. Today is day 18 of the Dragon Whisper ASMR Advent Calendar. We're going to continue reading A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens. Um, brief summary of what we've done so far is we've established that Marley is dead, Scrooge is a jerk, who I'm pretty sure is borderline massive human resources infringement and his nephew loves Christmas <laughs> All right, so let's continue <clears throat> there are many things from which I might have derived good by which I have not profited I dare say returned the nephew Christmas among the rest but I am sure I have always thought of Christmas time when it has come around Apart from the veneration due to a, its sacred name and origin, if anything belonging to it can be apart from that, as a good time. A kind, forgiving, charitable, pleasant time. The only time I know of, in the long calendar of the year, when men and women seem by one consent to open their shut-up hearts freely, and to think of people below them as if they were fellow passengers to the grave, and not another race of creatures bound on other journeys. And therefore, uncle, Though it has never put a scrap of gold or silver in my pocket, I believe that it has done me good, and will do me good, and I say, God bless it. The clerk in the tank involuntarily applauded. Becoming immediately sensible of the impropriety, he poked the fire and extinguished the last frail spark forever. Let me hear another sound from you, said Scrooge, and you'll keep your Christmas by losing your situation. You're quite a powerful speaker, sir, he added, turning to his nephew. I wonder you, you don't go into Parliament. Don't be angry, Uncle. Come, dine with us tomorrow. Scrooge said that he would see him. Yes, indeed he did. He went the whole length of the expression. He said that he would see him in that extremity first. But why, cried Scrooge's nephew, why? Why did you get married, said Scrooge? Because I fell in love. Because you fell in love, growled Scrooge, as if it were the only one thing in the world more ridiculous than a merry Christmas. Good afternoon. Nay, uncle, but you never came to see me before that happened. Why give it as a reason for not coming now? Good afternoon, said Scrooge. I want nothing from you. I ask nothing of you. Why can we? Why cannot we be friends? Good afternoon, said Scrooge. I am sorry with all my heart to find you so resolute. We have never had any quarrel to which I have been a party, but I have made the trial in homage to Christmas, and I'll keep my Christmas humor to the last, so a Merry Christmas, Uncle. Good afternoon, said Scrooge, and a Happy New Year. Good afternoon, said Scrooge. His nephew left the room without an angry word, notwithstanding. He stopped at the outer door to bestow the greetings of the season on the clerk, who, cold as he was, was warmer than Scrooge, for he returned them cordially. There's another fellow, muttered Scrooge, who overheard him, my clerk, with fifteen shillings a week, and a wife and family, talking about a merry Christmas. I'll retire to Bedlam. This lunatic, in letting Scrooge's nephew out, and let two other people in. They were portly gentlemen, pleasant to behold, and now stood with their hats off in Scrooge's office. They had books and papers in their hands, and bowed to him. Scrooge and Marley's, I believe, said one of the gentlemen, referring to his list. Have I the pleasure of addressing Mr. Scrooge or Mr. Marley? Mr. Marley has been dead these seven years, Scrooge replied. He died seven years ago, this very night. We have no doubt his liberality is well represented by his surviving partner, said the gentleman, presenting his credentials. It certainly was, for they had been two kindred spirits. At the ominous word liberality, Scrooge frowned and shook his head and handed the credentials back. Again. At this festive season of the year, Mr. Scrooge, said the gentleman, taking up a pen, it is more than usually desirable that we sh should make some slight provision for the poor and the destitute, who suffer greatly at the present time. Many thousands are in want of common ne 
necessities. Hundreds of thousands are in want of common comfort, sir. Are there no prisons? said Scrooge. Plenty of prisons, says the gentleman, laying down the pen again. And the union workhouses? demanded Scrooge. Are they still in operation? They are, still, returned the gentleman. I wish I could say they were not. The treadmill and the poor law are in full vigor, then? said Scrooge. Both very busy, sir. Oh, I was afraid from what you had said at first that something had occurred to stop them in their useful course, said Scrooge. I'm very glad to hear it. Under the impression that they scarcely furnish Christian cheer of mind or body to the multitude, returned the gentleman, a few of us are endeavoring to raise a fund to buy the poor some meat and drink, and means of warmth. We choose this time because it is a time of all others when want is keenly felt and abundance rejoices. What shall I put you down for? Nothing, Scrooge replied. You wish to be anonymous? I wish to be left alone, said Scrooge. Since you ask me what I wish, gentlemen, that is my answer. I don't make my, marry myself at Christmas, and I can't afford to make idle people marry. I help to support the establishments I have mentioned. They cost enough, and those who are badly off must go there. Many can't go there, and many would rather die. If they would rather die, said Scrooge, then had better, they had better do it, and decrease the surplus population. Besides, excuse me, I don't know that. But you might know it, observed the gentleman. It's not my business, Scrooge returned. It's enough for a man to understand his own business, and not to interfere in other people's. Mine occupies me constantly. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Seeing clearly that it would be useless to pursue their point, the gentleman withdrew. Scrooge returned his labors with an improved opinion of himself, and in a more facetious temper than was usual with him. Meanwhile the fog and darkness had thickened so that people ran about with flaring links, proffering their services to go before horses and carriages, and conduct them on their way to the ancient tower of a church, whose gruff old bell was always peeping silly down, slyly down at Scrooge out of a gothic window in the wall, became invisible and struck the hours and quarters in the clouds with tremulous vibrations. Afterwards, as if it were, if it's, if it's, if it's, afterwards, as if its teeth were chattering in its frozen head up there, the cold became intense, and the main sh in the main street, at the corner of the court, some laborers were repairing the gas pipes, and had lighted a great fire in a brazier, round which a party of ragged men and boys were gathered, warming their hands and winking, winking their eyes before the blaze in rapture. The water plug being left in solitude, its overflowing sullen, sullenly congealed, and turned to misanthropic ice. The brightness of the shops where holly sprigs and berries crackled in the lamp heat of the windows, made pale faces ruddy as they passed. Poulterers and grocers' trades became a splendid joke, a glorious pageant, with which it was next to impossible to believe that such dull principles as bargain and scale had anything to do. The Lord Mayor, in, his, in the stronghold of the mighty mansion house, gave orders to his fifty cooks and butlers to keep Christmas as a Lord Mayor's household should, and even the little tailor, whom he had shined five shillings on the previous Monday for being drunk and bloodthirsty in the streets, stirred up tomorrow's pudding in his garret, while his lean wife and the baby sullied out to buy the beef. Alright, I'm going to end that there. Um, and tomorrow, we will once again continue A Christmas Carol. So thank you for joining me, and as always, have a peaceful day. Bye.